So our readings today, well, our readings for the last couple of days are following a theme more than any particular book. So Tuesday it was from Isaiah, Wednesday it's from Jonah, today it's from Esther. So we're following different themes rather than kind of reading our way through a certain book. So it's always helpful to look at the readings in the gospel and try and determine what's what's the theme, what's the message, what's what's the why as such. Uh, were these chosen and put together because there, there is, there is a, a reason for it. It's not just random. Just to kind of recap on the story of Esther and then we'll try and piece it all together. Uh, so Esther was a Jew and uh, they had been exiled or brought into exile by the Persians. So she ended up, uh, because of her being somewhat easy on the eyes, she was accosted by the king and uh, she, she became one, one of his wives. So uh, there she is anyway as, the, as the, the most powerful woman in the kingdom. Uh, but she's a Jew. So she's a Jew in, in a Persian kingdom. Uh, powerful on one hand, but it all goes a bit pear-shaped in that Haman, one of the uh, leading officials, uh, in the king's court, doesn't like Jews, basically. He takes, takes offense to Mordecai, uh, Esther's cousin, uncle, I believe, and um, he basically wants all the Jews killed. So he convinces the king that these Jews are a threat, they're a danger, and that they should be exterminated, right? Uh, it's very harsh and very blunt. And the king uh, actually gives in and says, okay, this is, this, and proclaims a decree that the, the Jews then are to be killed. Okay, so then Queen Esther then, as I say, just this Jewish queen married to Ahasuerus, King Ahasuerus, King Ahasuerus uh, the Persian, she is the only thing standing between the extermination of her people and the king, the most powerful man. So what does she do? This is, this is her prayer. She makes this prayer. And in, in this context, if you think of, of, of the context now, that this whole reading makes a lot more sense. O oh Lord, my king, she's speaking to God now, the only one, come to my help for I am alone and have no one apart from you, no helper but you. I am about to take my life in my hands. I have been taught from my earliest years in the bosom of my family that you, Lord, chose Israel out of all the nations and our ancestors out of all the peoples of all times, to be your heritage forever, and that you treated them as you promised. Remember, Lord, reveal yourself in the time of our distress. As for me, give me courage. God of gods and master of all power, put persuasive words into my mouth when I face the lion. Change his feeling into hatred for our enemy, that the latter and all like him may be brought to their end. As for ourselves, save us by your hand and come to my help, for I am alone and have no one but you, Lord. Now, so again, the, the, context, the context of the story makes the, the story a whole lot more impactful, uh, knowing that, again, she's trying to save all of her people present in exile. Uh, so the immense responsibility that falls upon us. So, so, so what does she do? Uh, just to fill in a little more detail, if I may. She starts uh, three days of fasting and prayer. Okay, so ending her prayer on the third day, Esther took off her penitential garments and put on her royal attire. Radiant in appearance after invoking the all-seeing God and Savior, she took two maids with her and leaned gently on one for support, while the other followed carrying her train. Right, it's a, lo it's a lovely image. She looked radiant in her perfect beauty, her face depicting love and joy, even though her heart was frozen with fear. So it's, it's a beautiful little book. Uh, so, so then kind of all kind of delicately, and uh, oh dear, she makes her way to the king, okay? So, uh, so after passing through all the doors, she found herself face to face with the king seated on his throne, awe-inspiring in the full array of his majesty, his robes all covered with gold and precious stones. As she looked up, his face flushed with majestic anger, interestingly. The queen, the queen faltered, <sighs> okay, turned pale and leaned weakly upon the shoulder of the maid in front of her. 
Then God changed the heart of the king's anger to gentleness. Alarmed, he sprang from his throne, took Esther into his arms until she had recovered and comforted her with, comforted her with soothing words. What is it, Esther? He said. <laughs> I am, but listen to this. I am your brother. Take heart. Right? It's, it's lovely. It's like Tobit, you know, my, my sister and my bride, the way he addresses her. I am your brother. So, okay, you're fairly pretty, in fairness to you. But in this moment, that's not what I'm here for. I'm here as, as your brother. I recognize, like, your, you know, your, your human dignity. It's not just about whatever, the way you look. Um, I, I'm here as your brother. I see you, that you're in need of help. What can I do for you? Then he promises her half his kingdom if she were to ask for it. And she says, no, 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 no. Just come to a meal. She, she, she puts on a, a big spread for himself and for Haman, the guy who wanted to kill all the Jews in the first place. So she puts on a big spread for them. Then he asks, what, 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 what else do you want? What, what do you want of me? I will give you half my kingdom. He says it again. And she says, no, 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 no. Just come and dine with me again. Puts on a second meal for uh, the king and Haman. And then the king, unable to sleep that night, uh, he gets up and he asks for the, the records, the chronicles uh, of, of, his king, of his kingship, of his tenure, to be read to him. And it becomes apparent, it's read out, that, that Mordecai, the protector, if you will, of Esther, the Jew, had actually saved his life. So he had foiled a plot to, to, to end the king's life. And the king asked, well, sorry, how was, how was Mordecai, how was he thanked for this? What, what prize was he given? And the answer came, well, none. And he said, well, he must be thanked. Now, he was, he's the reason that Haman wants to kill all the Jews. And now th this man has suddenly been recognized as, as a hero. Okay. So, between the long and the short of it, Esther then somewhat, again, what, what's interesting is like, on one hand, she looks weak, but she's the most powerful woman there. And her prayer makes her even more stunning and radiant and beautiful. Her prayer, so her fasting and her prayer, it makes her look weak, but it actually makes her more, it gives her more influence in the king's heart. It's interesting. It's just, it seems like the opposite to what the world would say. The, like when we think of Lent, right? That, uh, you know, prayer, fasting, almsgiving, come on now, I mean, fasting, it's kind of old school stuff, isn't it? And, you know, giving things up and, you know, surely uh, Lent, you know, in the modern era should be more about like, getting regular exercise, you know, and working out and uh, taking care of yourself. That's important, taking care of yourself. So that's what we should be doing. Now, while we should take care of ourselves, yes, the um, season of Lent is about self-denial. So in order to, to, to learn how to control our will, that our will doesn't dominate us, you know, that we make, we deny ourselves in order to make space in our hearts for God. So this is what Esther does. She denies herself food and all of her regalia and her so on and so forth, fasting, and that makes her even more beautiful, me even more influential. Similarly, our prayer, fasting, and giving, uh, makes our prayer even more powerful because it comes from an even purer heart, a, a, a will that wants to do God's will. Okay? So if you will, it makes us more powerful, even though we might feel physically weaker. Okay? Or we might feel uh, that we've renounced, you know, how, how difficult it is to renounce movies or whatever it may be, you know, I had to give up a whole half hour of YouTube, like really in the grand scheme of things, it really is nothing. Uh, but it makes us as such more powerful because I've renounced myself in favor of God, in favor of God. So how does it end up? Well, she says to the king, Ahasuerus, he says, you know, what is, what is wrong with you, my, my, my sister, my bride? And she says, well, that man there, Haman, and she probably points like that, Haman, he wants to destroy Mordecai, who saved your life, and all of my people. And he said, well, this, this cannot be. This cannot be so. This cannot be so. So even though he was the one who had promulgated this law that all the Jews should be killed, he found a way around it, okay, and was able to save them all. And, okay, Haman ended up getting the punishment that he had allotted for, for Mordecai. We won't go into it, but it doesn't end well for him. Um, point being, though, the, the power of intercessory prayer. Okay, so the power of prayer, the power of appearing weak, so even like a, a prayerful posture. It's an interesting thing, like a prayerful posture, the standard prayerful prayer, praying posture 
for us has always been kneeling down, which isn't to say that, you know, again, we're bad, and, but we should humble ourselves before God. You know, and it's, it's, a, it's becoming ever more popular that even in prayer centers or chapels, churches, that they don't have kneelers anymore because we're going to kind of sit and relax because it's about, it's about our relaxation, about us taking care of ourselves, and then we will tell God what we demand of him. Right? Instead of kneeling before him, humbly imploring the all good God, but recognizing that I'm not here to command him anything. I can't command God to do anything. It's never about commanding God. We humbly beseech him, we ask him, we pray. So that's why like, kneeling, is, it's important. Look, if, if, you're, if you have problems with the old kneecaps or, 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 or hips and can't get back up, no bother. Look, I mean, the Lord understands that too, you know, so it's not like, don't be driving yourself into the ground, but let's not forget the sense behind all of these things. I don't kneel before any man. If the president of Ireland were to walk in to this room, we'd hopefully notice because he's a bit small in stature, but, um, but I, wouldn't, I wouldn't kneel before him. Like, I'm not going to kneel before him. Um, there's no man I'd kneel before. None. I mean, even if the Pope comes in, we don't, you don't kneel before the Pope, you know? The only person we kneel before is God. End of story. Like, that's, his posture is reserved for him. Okay. So then the Lord says, Ask and it will be given to you. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For the one who asks always receives. The one who searches always finds. The one who knocks will always have the door open to him. Okay, so in our prayer. The Lord says some pretty strong words here that we will always receive, find, and have the door open to us. Now, concretely, our experience of prayer probably is not that. Our experience of prayer is probably that I have prayed for things I didn't get. I have prayed for favors or for healings or for um, exams or whatever that didn't go the way I wanted, okay? It can happen, for example, that you're praying for you know, your 94-year-old granny uh, who has lived a, a, a good life and you're praying for her healing and maybe she doesn't, she doesn't pull through, okay? So how then can we say with, with confidence, you know, just simply ask and it will be given to you, search and you will find, knock and it will be open to you, when our experience is often that we didn't get exactly what we asked for. Okay. Our vision of things when we pray is, tends to be quite short term, okay? We only see a very short uh, piece of history, very short period of history, and we don't see the state of a person's soul, we don't see God's plan for the person's salvation. Like when it comes to salvation, we don't, I can't see the state of your soul, uh, I can't tell if you're, if you're ready for heaven, and to be honest then from a human perspective, when it is time for a person to go, we're gonna, on a very human level, we're going to miss them. So we don't want them to go. Even though we do want them to be happy, we do want them to get to heaven. At the same time, we don't want them to go. So we can be kind of, we can be kind of torn here. So we, we don't see a lot of the picture. You know? We're basically looking uh, at, at our lives like through a tube. You, know, you see a small little bit at any one time. But uh, we don't see the full picture. So when we pray, when we knock, when we ask, what do we get? What do we always get? We always get Jesus. And this, this is the answer, you see. So, like, ask and it will be given to you. So I'm asking for someone's healing or for a job, right? And as I'm asking, I'm praying and I'm kneeling before the Lord and I'm imploring him. I'm saying, Lord, I have no one but you, like Esther. I have no one but you, Lord. Help me in, our, in my time of need. Now, it may be I don't get the job. It may be whatever favor I was asking for is not granted me. But my faith is growing. My love for the Lord is growing. And therefore, the big picture, right? My preparation for heaven, that's being granted to me. I'm, I'm, I'm growing in my love for the Lord. The, the most important thing, whatever jobs will come and go and, you know, all those things. Uh, but your salvation, that after 10,000 years of heaven, you're only getting settled in like. You know, this is all eternity we're talking about. So whatever we ask for here, and the Lord often does grant what we ask for here as well. Don't get me wrong. I was even talking to someone yesterday who said that um, at home they were, they were uh, 
uh, when she was thinking within herself, um, that for, for my birthday now, I'd love to go to Lisieux, you know, with the family, but like pulling the whole family to Lisieux, and then the brothers would be like, oh, I'm missing the matches, and I'm missing training, and all this kind of thing. Oh, it would never happen, it would never, no, it would be too much to ask. And that evening then, her mom came to her and said, look, do you know, for your birthday, do you know what we thought? We hope you don't mind now. Would you mind if we all went to Lisieux? You know what I mean? So like, sometimes the Lord gives us the deepest desires of our hearts, the good desires of our hearts, or sometimes he just gives us even the superficial, unimportant things. I mean, her life would have been exactly the same without going to Lisieux. But it's just, sometimes the Lord just wants to give you a little gift. He wants to give you a bouquet of flowers. Bouquets of flowers are entirely useless. What do you do? You put them in the vase and then they die. Like, you know, they're entirely super, but it's, it's a way of expressing love. You know, it's all about being practical, right? Sometimes God gives us more than we ask for, okay? Uh, he gives us good things, beautiful things. Okay, that's, so sometimes he does give us even more than we ask for. Sometimes he doesn't. But the ultimate goal in it all is that we get him and we get heaven, which are kind of the same thing. You get Jesus for all eternity, that's heaven. So when we pray, when we ask, when we knock, we always get the Lord. And he asks us to do so persistently, to keep going, to keep knocking, and to do so with great humility, as Queen Esther does. My Lord, our King, the only one, come to my help, for I am alone and have no helper but you. Amen.